piece of Bible, I invite you to get one from the cabinet there, where you can be able to follow along. I invite everyone to open this morning to the letter of Colossians, this letter that we are learning verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. This is on page 983, if you're using the Bible that we distribute here. All of us should treat this as a letter from God, which is exactly what it is. The Bible says all scripture has been breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof. That's how to correct, uh, or, or for re rebuking me for where I'm wrong, for correction, showing me how to get it right, and for training in righteousness, how to be trained me how to live in the way God wants me to, that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. So every part of Scripture contributes to your development in your understanding of Christ and become a mature Christian. That's why it is important that in a good Bible teaching church, all of the Bible is taught. Because it all has value. This is why you ought to come to a verse on Wednesday night. Because you're reading through a portion of the Bible that you have a chance to understand. This has value to your life. Anyone knows it's been coming to immerse the first four weeks. We've learned an awful lot about God and about life so far. But now we come to this very special letter, a letter from God, to be understood by all Christians. And so far he has said to us, May grace and peace be multiplied to you from God our Father. Grace and peace. This is the place that a Christian, this is the starting point of his life. He lives under God's kindness and favor. He is perfectly well with God. That's how the letter begins. I just want you to know that from God, God is giving you his favoritism. He's giving you his kindness. And he's giving you total wellness. That's how your Christian life begins. And that's the atmosphere in which it's lived. And then he says, he prays a prayer. May you be filled with the knowledge. May God fill you with the knowledge of his will so that you may fully please him. I pray that God will fully help you in every part of your life. Know what he would wish for you to do, so that every, each and every part of your life you would live in a way that pleases him. And then he says next in Colossians, he prays for them, as we saw that, and then he says last week, you have been rescued from the domain of darkness or from the rule of darkness and transferred to the rule of Jesus. We want you Christians to understand this. At one time you were under the power, the authority of darkness, but now you are under the power and the authority of Jesus. Now he comes to this next verse, verse 14. And I want you to notice what the scripture says to all Christians in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. Verse 14. In whom the whom there is talking about Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And we need to think about what this scripture is saying to all of us who belong to Jesus. Notice, first of all, this first the, the, the word we have. This verb have is a present tense indicative active in the Greek language. This means, when it's in the present tense, it means this is an ongoing state. In the Greek language, if anything is ever in the present tense, a verb, this means it's ongoing. So whatever this is that you have as a Christian, you have this on in an ongoing way. You presently and will always continue to presently have something. It's in the indicative. This is a mood in the Greek language. Indicative means the fact. It means the state of something. So it is a point of fact about you Christians. You presently have what he's going to say next. And you in an ongoing way will have this. This is the status of your life. This is the indicative. This indicates something about you as a fact. Okay? And it's in, it's a present tense, indicative mood in the active voice. This has something to do with the present tense. This means, again, that this is something that is actively taking place for you in an ongoing way, 
as a status. In Jesus, you presently possess, that's the word have, you presently have this, and you always will have this. What is it that you as a Christian presently have, and will always have in an ongoing, never-ending way, in whom we have redemption? Now the Bible says, think about it before I talk about the word redemption, we have this, we possess this. You know, the Bible says to Christians in 1 John 1, if we walk in the light, because remember, I've been transferred out of the rule and authority of darkness, I've been transferred under the rule and authority of Jesus, I've been transferred under the rule and authority of light now. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. This is an ongoing thing. You have constant cleansing. This is an ongoing status in which you live. Now that you no longer walk in the darkness, but now that you walk in the light, you have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus is cleansing you from your sin. Colossians 1 says, just understand this. You need to understand that in Jesus you possess in an ongoing way which you will always possess it's a permanent status of your life you have redemption now what is redemption the word redemption means release because of a payment it means deliverance because of a payment redemption is that it would be like 200 years ago in America here, 150 years ago when they were slaves, people could go and redeem their slave. They could go uh, to whoever it was, someone could go to that man's master and say, I want to redeem him, and they would pay the price, and this person would be released. He would be let go from the status that he used to be in. Because the price was paid. Redemption is to release because of a payment. To deliver because of a payment. The Bible says that in Jesus, Christians have a permanent release. A permanent letting go. For example, listen to what Psalms, I love this Psalm, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. O oh Lord, if you should keep track of my guilty deeds, O oh Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord there is abundant redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his guilt. Scripture says that in Jesus, if you are in Jesus, you possess in a present tense status, which will never end. You have a permanent, ongoing release from your old master. You have a permanent, ongoing deliverance because a payment has been made. Do you guys know right when Jesus was born? I mean, he was just a few months old. His parents brought him to the temple, which was a Jewish custom at the time. I want you to see what gets said about him as a little infant. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verse 22. Luke chapter 2 and verse 22, we find out there were two elderly people that were serving in the temple. They'd been there all their lives, praying and hoping for one day to see the Messiah. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 22, and when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, by the way, the Bible said that in the Old Testament, that every firstborn son belongs to the Lord. But instead of the parents giving them to the Lord, they would go to the temple 
and redeem their son at the cost of, what was the price it says? Two turtle doves or two young pigeons. They would purchase them, redeem them, to bring them back home. Because the firstborn son, after going back to the Passover, the firstborn always belongs to God. But they go to the temple, they pay the redemption price, now he, he's theirs. Now there was a man, verse 25, in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Imagine that your parents are walking to this little tiny infant. And you walk in the room, and all of a sudden here comes an elderly man. He says, let me have this baby. And he takes the baby up in his arms, and look what he says. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for a revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So the thoughts from many hearts have been revealed. Notice this, just a few days after Jesus was born, someone says to Mary, this is what's going to happen. Now notice next, verse 36, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. So this lady has been a widow probably 60 years. She served somewhere on the temple grounds. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, right when Simeon is holding Jesus and says this to God and says this to Mary, here comes Anna, the 84-year-old woman right there. And look what happens. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Everyone that was coming into the temple that day, here comes the elderly woman, Anna. Guys, the one you're waiting for has come. He's here. The one who is going to pay the price to deliver God's people. He's going to give the payment so that they will from now on possess deliverance. They will from now on possess release because this is the one who's going to pay the price. The Bible says that all have sinned, all humanity has, and all human beings have fallen short of the glory of God, the magnificence, the righteousness, the holiness of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified. That means declared and treated as righteous. Even though they have fallen short of the glory of God, they will be declared and treated as righteous as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus is the payment that sets them free. Therefore, God declares them a free person, a righteous person. He treats them as such because this is a gift. Redemption is not something a person earns. It is something that is done for them. Scripture says they are declared righteous and treated as righteous as a gift by His grace for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. The word propitiation means a sacrifice that satisfies the wrath, that pays the price, basically. God put Jesus forward as the payment. The Bible says as a propitiation in His blood. To be received by faith. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you are going to be redeemed, if you are going to be delivered, if you're going to be released from your debt, 
someone has to pay. The Bible says the debt you owe to God, every one of us, is that you have violated his law. And therefore, because of that, there is a price to pay. The scripture says God has put forth Jesus as the payment of that penalty. And he is to be received by faith. Lord, I believe what you're saying. I believe this is who Jesus is, and I receive it. The Bible says in Christ, Christians currently possess in an ongoing way deliverance because of the payment. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, Thanks be because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus is our redemption. In Christ we possess this. And what was the means of that redemption, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? What was the thing that Jesus paid so that I could be released? The Bible says, in whom we have redemption by his blood. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. That is the price that he paid. Yes. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, this is the blood of the covenant which is being given for the forgiveness of many. <clears throat> Scripture says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 that God has purchased the church by his blood. That's what he purchased them with. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is the only way it happens because the life is in the blood and the wages of sin is death. Someone's got to pay with life the penalty of sin. That's why without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That is the cost. That is the debt. Someone's got to pay that. And the Bible says that when you're in Jesus, you have an ongoing, you will continue to possess redemption, deliverance, a letting go, because the payment has been made. The Bible says about Jesus, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, outside the camp, he took away the sins of his people. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, and verse 5, to him who loved us and freed us from our sins, by his blood. In fact, look at me at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. The last book of the Bible, Revelation 5 and verse 9, says about Jesus, You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed. <coughs> Ransom is a similar word to redeem. Ransom is the actual thing you paid. Redemption is the act of paying it. Redemption is, is me delivering by a payment. The ransom is the payment. The Bible says in Revelation 5, verse 9, you ransomed by your blood a people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. God has purchased for himself his own people, and the price he paid was the blood of Jesus from every tribe and nation and language and tongue. They all belong to him. And all these people all over the world, ever since Jesus, they have redemption. They have this release. They have this deliverance because of the payment. By the way, the Bible tells us, if you go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, this is a very important scripture. Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 12, this is page 1006, if you're using the Bible here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 says about Jesus, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Now, ladies and gentlemen, understand, God is telling you something. This is important for you to know as you go forward in your Christian life. In Jesus, you have an eternal redemption. You have an eternal release from your debt. Because it's not the blood of some animal. It's the blood of the eternal son. And because of that, that redemption continues on. 
because your priest lives. The Bible says in Hebrews 7, he is still on this today interceding. That's why he is able to save them to the uttermost, everyone who comes to God through faith in him. He saves them to the end of all time. So understand this. God wants you to know some really great news this morning. If you have Jesus, you have eternal deliverance from your debt because of a payment. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for Himself a people for His own possession who are zealous of good works. This is a real redemption. Let me tell you something. If you had been a slave and you were set free, you would know it. Just like a person that I said last week who'd been living all their lives in darkness and now lives in light, they would know it. And if you know about your own self, I was a slave at one point in my life. And I have come to experience redemption. I have been set free. This is something you would really know. One a famous pastor 100 years ago, G. Campbell Morgan in London, England, said, this is the complete restoration of the life to fellowship with God, just like it was for Adam and Eve. The spirit of man is consciously at peace with God in righteousness as a condition and in joy as an experience. That's right. This is what's happened to him. In Jesus, this person has eternal deliverance from his debt. He has eternal release because of a payment. The scripture says, everybody, in Christ, this is what you need. This is not in the church. The church, the scripture does not say in the church you have eternal redemption. This is what Rome would tell you. Rome says, if you ever notice about Roman Catholicism, the focus is on the church. It's not in Christ. Not in the church do I have eternal redemption. Not in myself. Not in anyone else. I have only eternal redemption. This is something I receive by faith. Notice back in our text, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14. In him we have redemption, namely the forgiveness of sins. Do you know the word forgive in the Bible means to send away? It's very close to the word redeem to release from an obligation or a debt, to let you go, to pardon you. In Jesus, I have release from my sins. I am no longer under a debt to them. I no longer have to fear judgment for them. I am no longer enslaved to them. I have been released. I have this eternally. This is the state in which I live. You guys remember in the Old Testament when they would have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur? One day a year in the fall, they would all gather, all the Jewish people would gather at the tabernacle. And the priests would take a spotless animal and sacrifice the blood on the altar as a propitiation. God symbolically receiving the blood of this substitute sacrifice to pay his wrath for all the Jews sin that year. And the priest would take the blood off the sacrifice and he'd walk inside into the very center of the tabernacle, what they called the Holy of the Holies, where God's presence was, where only the priest could go one day a year. And when he would enter into the Holy of Holies, he would come to the, where the exact presence of God was, the Ark of the Covenant. This wooden box covered with gold, covered with angels. And inside the box was God's law. This is where the presence of God was in the center of the tabernacle. And he would take the blood and sprinkle it on the covering of that law, which was called the mercy seat. And what was he doing? He was covering. He, the word means atone. Atone means to cover. He was covering God's law. He was taking away God's wrath because of the sacrifice of a spotless, innocent substitute. So God's wrath is now gone. The people
people of Israel are freed of all their guilt. And guess what happened? He would walk now back outside the tabernacle, and all the people were there, making sure the priest was alive. When the priest came out, they had in the courtyard of the tabernacle a live goat. They called him a scapegoat. You know what the priest would do? He would take the blood that remained in his hands and he would pray. He'd actually grab the horns of the goat and in a symbolic way transfer the guilt of the people onto the scapegoat. You know what they would do? They would take that scapegoat out of the courtyard, take him far, 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 far away out of the desert, out of the wilderness, never to be seen again. And what did that symbolize, everybody? That when God forgives your sin, never seen again. That's called expiation. The guilt is removed. Now ladies and gentlemen, in Jesus you have this. You have complete letting go. You have a complete release. You have a complete pardon. A total and complete pardon. There is nothing on your record. There is nothing between you and God. In Jesus, you presently possess, and you will tomorrow, and you will next month, and you will every day of your life. You have a complete and total pardon for your sins. That's what you have. Now, do you believe that? That is the good news. The Bible says, when you believe what he's done for you, he will purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God. You will not walk around feeling guilty about what you did, but you will believe the gospel. Lord, I believe that in Jesus I have an eternal redemption. Right now, I have been completely delivered from all my sins. That is my status. And it will be tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. And as I walk in the light, as you are in the light, I have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus is cleansing me from my sin. So when I, as a Christian, now walk in the light, I continue to walk away from the darkness and God continues to sanctify me. When I do stumble and fall, I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you for my eternal Redeemer. I, I just confess my sin to you. The Bible says when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the promise to Christians. Even as you walk in this morning, you say, Lord, boy, my attitude or way I behaved in recent days, last night, even this morning, was wrong. And I just simply confess it to you. The Bible says, that, remember I've told you in the past, the word confess means to say the same thing. It's to agree with God. I'm going to call what you call it, God. The Bible says because you have an eternal redemption, when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness because you have you. And guys, I want you to know, as a Christian, all of us, you have someone who is very much opposing you. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brothers and Satan. And what he wants to do with you is accuse you and say, look at you. You supposedly have been saved by Jesus, and yet you still struggle with selfishness, and you still struggle with anger, and you still struggle with lust, and you still struggle with this and that, and gossip. Unforgiveness, worry, and fear. He says, Look at you. We have a great passage in the scripture of Zechariah which tells us when Satan does that with one of God's children, God's standing there and he rebukes Satan. He says, Listen, I'm the one who pulled him out of the fire. And God tells one of his angels, You give him a clean robe and you sit this guy down and zip it. Because God's the one who saved you. Who can condemn you? Christ Jesus is the one who justified. He's died and lives again. This morning, God wants you to begin this week. He doesn't want you to forget. This is why your life can be filled with such grace and peace. Because you have eternal redemption. How many people spend so many years of their life laboring under guilt they can't forgive themselves? They can't forgive other people ever really truly believe the gospel believe that Christ is the one who God put forward to pay the price and when you have him you have redemption eternally complete and total pardon no more debt, no more obligation, no more guilt this is what you have in Jesus the absolute and total forgiveness of sins 
This is why the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Peter preached to all the Jews in Jerusalem, he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts chapter 10, verse 43, Let it be known to you that forgiveness of sins is preached in his name. The Bible says in Acts 13, he made him Lord and Savior to grant repentance and forgiveness of sins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it does not honor our Father when you don't believe it. You still walk around all discouraged. You still walk around. I know what you're saying, God, but I just don't. No, God wants you to experience his grace and peace. Everything is well. It really is, even though it's a battle and your flesh is waging war against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and sometimes you stumble and fall. But that doesn't change your status. Your status before God is eternally redeemed. And it's when you believe that, when you really trust Him for that, that's when you don't wallow in your sin for a long time. You know what happens to people? They get discouraged. I can't do this. And they go on for a little binge. The thing that helps them to stand back up and say, okay, I, I, okay, I stumbled and fell there, but I know who I am in Jesus. And Lord, I agree with you about what just happened. I confess it to you. Uh, and God says, I am faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your sins because you have an eternal redeemer, Jesus. You have, you have redemption. That way you can leave it aside and get back up again. You get on the road and follow Jesus. You keep walking in the light. Because this redemption is not in you. It's not in the church. It's in Christ. In Christ you have eternal deliverance, eternal pardon from your sins. Do you believe that this morning? Do you feel it? I'll tell you what, probably all of us, I don't know, maybe is there someone you have in this world that you can think of right now that you you would be kind of scared. You would feel really awkward if you walked into the same room as him. They avoid you, you avoid them because you know there's something that you did they have not forgiven you. It's painful. That's a painful thing. To have someone in your life that will not forgive you. And what an awesome thing it is when there was something that someone else, and they grant you a full and total pardon. We could just be friends. We could just be at peace and go forward. You know what? God knows what you have in Christ. That's the greatest thing in life. You're free. There's nothing holding you back. There is no stain. The Bible says that Jesus took the full record of debt, the full account of all the debt you owed to God for your sins. And the Bible says God nailed it to the cross. Praise God. And because he did that, the scripture says he disarmed the rulers and authorities, the demonic powers who want to accuse you and whisper in you and say, look at you. You claim to be some Christian. I know you. The Bible says because of redemption, God takes the entire thing, tears it up, throws it away. Now what are you going to say? Nothing to say. He disarms. He disarmed the devil. So when the devil comes in your life and accuses you, what he likes to do, that's, his, that's what his name means. You remember what you have in Jesus. You have eternal redemption. You have eternally releasing the pardon of your sins. I love what the scripture says in Ruth chapter 4. When Boaz redeems Ruth. And Naomi says to Ruth in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 14. Naomi says to Ruth, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer. And the same thing could be said about all God's children here this morning. Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer. If you 
you were Ruth all those years ago, poor woman in a foreign country. There's no hope that your prospects will ever change. And in some way, in kindness, and in love, and in grace, redeems you out of the state that you were in and brings you into love. You say, wow. what in Jesus the gospel is in Christ you have redemption the forgiveness of your sins feel it believe it live in it Lord help us this morning to believe the gospel Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Blessed be the Lord, who has not left us without a Redeemer. We praise you, Jesus.